All right, welcome back to Waste Some Time with Jason Green. I am Jason Green, bringing you brand new interviews right here on YouTube. This one has been in the works for quite some time. We were going back and forth trying to find the day, trying to find the time. Uh, Tammy Down is one of the last of the busiest rockers you'll find. Uh, he probably spends more of his life living on a tour bus than at home. So he finally had a little bit of a lull, and we were able to... Uh, uh, he was able to join me this morning, and we're going to talk a lot about uh, some of the history of Faster Pussycat and uh, what they're up to now. All that and more right after this. All right, please welcome Tammy Down. What's going on? Good, I'm Jeff. glad we you... finally got you. Yeah. Um, nice shirt. I like it. Thank you. I'm sporting my newly dead shirt for the I can't hardcore. Believe you still have it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I had to do some. And yeah. it looks good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so, Tammy, I'm glad because you don't do a ton of these. You know, once in a while you'll do something to promote, but you don't do a ton of these. And I feel like you've got a great story. And Faster Pussycat really is one of the bands that stayed out there and still building audience to this day and a fresh audience. There's people who know this lineup that's been together much longer than the original lineup. And so uh, there's a lot to talk about. And I want to start by going backwards uh, because you're, you, you grew up in Seattle, Washington, right? Yeah. And your dad was a musician. And so it seems like music might have been in your jeans or, or leather pants. As they or say. my satin pants. <laughs> this is the 70s and late 60s so yeah was, yeah my dad was a guitar player it's 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 hard to believe i mean I, I mean i don't know if you say your age but you're 60 years old now 60 fucking years old yeah master pussycat view is 37 years old uh it's there's a lot of history and i i gotta say before we dive too much into it you told me let's do this interview after i get back from my walk I said, this is a new Tame Me Down. This is the I new. Know. Shit changes. Yeah, well, I'm not morning doing my walks. And I put mm -hmm. in a few miles every morning. It's great. Yeah. It's great. that, uh, And we'll talk about your health and how <laughs> you're doing now. But so you grew up in Washington. What were the bands you were first into as a kid? Just growing up. The typical stuff you, you want. Th then Lizzie. Uh, mm -hmm. The Stones was my first record, you know what I mean? So, and then growing up through like grade school and junior highs, Kiss and Boston and Aerosmith and Cheap Trick and all the stuff you grew up in the 70s, you know, as a kid. So that was pretty much all the rock shit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the best, some of the best music of probably of all time, definitely. Joan Jett, you know, I just... All that's through that period. I mean, I'm older than you, so stuff that your older brother or your folks or whatever be into, you know. Mm -hmm. Now, Tammy, the name Tammy is a nickname from your grandmother, right? Yeah. And what age did you start going by that name? When I came to Hollywood. Okay. My grand, it was like a nickname, but it was like my mom didn't go, you know, didn't call me. It was just basically my grandma did i didn't like it because it sounded like tammy and i was a boy and don't play sports and whatever i just thought it was just stupid so but whatever then you know then move to hollywood and you gotta come up with the everybody comes up with a change their shit and come up with a new persona and what not do it be who you want to be and do what you want to do and that's just kind of came into through a few people bouncing stuff around and then came up with that do you know what she meant by it it was from jetem my grandmother's italian though she's not french she used to deal in clothing she import clothing from italy and france europe basically to seattle to like bring it into like nordstrom's and and frederick and nelson's up there and she had her own little shop too in richmond beach but they she'd import clothes from italy women's fashions and stuff so her assistant and stuff was french and my grandmother was italian so she didn't speak french too well fashion would become a big part of your life as well because you you make that decision to move to hollywood and 
I got to ask you, I've asked almost everyone on my show, what what made the decision? How do you go, okay, that's it, this is where I'm going? Oh, because that's where, that's where bands that were coming up when I was like in high school. So that's where like Rat and Motley and not, and you'd see pictures of God. Yeah, that's you're you're you know a teenager. You know you want to go to where the California where the hot women are and cool bands are, and that's just what you know. That's when you're deciding what you want to do. You know, I want to be a, I want to be a rock star. I want to go there. So that was the main thing. My mom had moved to San Diego, and that was so that was close. That was closer to L.A. than Seattle. So, and when I left Seattle too, I wasn't, I wasn't old enough to, you know, go in the bars and stuff anyway. It was still just, you're still just out of high school, but you know, too, too young to get into bars or try to sneak in them. So when you were going from San Diego to Los Angeles, did you have a plan? Did you know where you were going to stay or what you were going to do for work? No clue. And we started just doing different different things we made a few trips up there me and my friends you know we go up there and hang out for a weekend and stay at the tro old Tropicana it used to be on Santa Monica and it was a total rock and roll motel there's a Ramada there now and it's nothing nothing like the Tropicana I've stayed, yeah I've stayed there it's not as much fun the Doors headquarters right across the street where they recorded uh, the records and uh, that that was a legendary place but like you said uh, yeah, Hollywood's and, not what it used to be and the duke and duke's restaurant was right underneath it it was just the best breakfast stuff uh some crazy times and that was before i was 21 too you know going up there we get into get into the troubadour and you know you can get into some of the other places and we get into the, the rainbow you just kind of pretend like you're old enough because you all done up and whatever some black eyeliner and you're all your black clothes and just kind of just walk in behind the next guy and just give him the five bucks to give him the ticket. And then you're in the rainbow. Then like, cool. I'm in a bar. Couldn't do that in Seattle or pretty much San Diego either. So I was only in Diego for still a little over a year, like a year and a half. I think San Diego had a big music scene too. And a lot of guys moved from San Diego to Los Angeles, Stephen Piercy and rat starts in San Diego. He sees Van Halen play the whiskey and brings everybody up with him. But um, yeah, that was just me. before. That was just before my time because I yeah, went, uh, those guys were gone. There was bands like probably eighty one, maybe. Yeah, I, I didn't come down till eighty five, mm -hmm. so or eighty four. I got down to San Diego in eighty four. Got up to L A in eighty five. But yeah, rap was already first? gone because I already heard a rap from Seattle when I was in Seattle before I came down. I got the rat EP. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so but it was like I didn't even know they were from Seattle. I thought it was just LA band, but I met Pierce Steven when I first one of my first times ever in LA. Him and I met Tommy the same, and I was like, killer, Matt and Motley in one day. That was pretty cool. I was like, yeah, so I was sure. like 18, 19, 19, something like that. Where were so where did you live when you first got there? Where was your first place? Where in San in Hollywood. Hollywood. LA. Hollywood, we came up, we came up to, uh, came up for a weekend, me and this girl, she was just a friend of mine. She's driving. I go, I'll go. So we went up and stayed at, got a room at the Sunset Motel. It was like right by Tower Records. It's gone now. It's like something, I think it's just a parking lot now. They've turned it into over there. But uh, I remember Adam was staying there, Adam Baum. And he was a friend from Adam Brenner was a friend of mine from Seattle. And he had just gotten a deal with Geffen and stuff. So that was all going on. And we, there was a show at the Palladium that was uh, Armored Saint Metallica and Adam Bomb. And we went to that and scammed tickets at the, uh, at the will call, just kind of looked over and we look at the list and I got, said some name i looked at it. i don't remember what it was but it had like eight or nine tickets plus so that's what we did got look look for the ones that have the biggest number next to it and we did and me and my friend ricky and a couple other people uh just scammed tickets from that show and kept one sold them all and so i had a few hundred bucks and we just then we found a free place to live that night that was right by where i live now just like a half a mile down the road 
over. You're the last of the uh, Mohicans, if you will, because you're still in Hollywood to this day. Most guys have moved, you know, somewhere else. You're still right where you started. I just, yeah. just got stuck here. I'm stuck mm -hmm. in Hollywood. It's, just, it's mainly the weather and my friends. You know what I mean? Because it's like I ride motorcycles and stuff too, and it's like year round. So it's like it's the best, and it's not humid. So, but that's why it just keeps 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 me gripped here so but i might move we're planning on probably maybe going somewhere but warm probably florida yeah, warm. just for a change but i don't know it's tough it's tough to leave la just for not for it's expensive and kind of ridiculous i don't go to bars it's not the nightlife i'm here for it's ma mainly the weather and my friends that i that i stick around yeah well and you've been a fixture in that scene for Wait some time. First job retail slut, the clothing store. Is that where you started? Yeah. First job was at KMET, was a radio station. We, me and my, me and my friend Ricky, Ricky Valentine, he was from Seattle. He came down the same time I came up. He he came down, I came up, and with some other friends of mine from Seattle. And we got a job at Amy T, but it's something and we call people and ask them what their favorite radio station was. And it was it didn't make shit. It was like minimum wage and in a in a room that with no windows and and uh so one of my friends from Fear Factory was his sister was there at work and too and Ricky. And there's was, there's was like eight of us and just calling out, but that lasted only maybe a month and then I start, then I got a job at retail slut. Yeah. And you were doing lights. At, it was at the same time as retail. Slut? I got a job at retail slut. And that that night at the rock and roll, rock and roll Denny's, I got a job doing lights at the Troubadour from Paul. He was he, Paul from leather wolf was doing uh bass player was doing sound. And he asked me if I wanted a job. I'm like killer. So I got it. Yeah, I got, I got two jobs in one day. Yeah, it's funny. Yeah, it's a small world. And for people who are watching who maybe don't know Los Angeles or Hollywood, uh, you have to have Rock and Roll Ralph's, the grocery store, yeah. and you have to have Rock and Roll Denny's. But these are the places you want to see rock stars. These are the places uh, that you you would frequent to, to see to see them. Um, so you're looking for a band. Mick Cripps uh, was a friend of yours, or we working together and. Some people think that maybe he was going to be in an early version of Faster Pussycat. Is, is that true? Me and Mick started Faster Pussycat because I met Mick through Robert, his twin brother. And he's like, my br Mick wasn't out here yet. He was moving from London. They're originally from Australia, but they were in London and Mick was coming out. He goes, Robert, oh, you got to meet my brother. He's, you guys get along really good. And then so when he got out, it was like a couple weeks later or whatever. That was right after I moved moved to LA and shit too. And then we just started hanging out and going to clubs and meeting people and trying to put together different shit. And then we both kind of got sidetracked on other things. It was, it was all quick. It was all super fast. It was just like a matter. And, and I was like 20, you know, just turned 21. And so, and then it was just meeting different people and he was meeting people. We were meeting, looking for people. We answered an ad, me and Mick did. We answered an ad and the music connection for guitar player available. Then it was Slash. And and he he invited us, hey, come down and see us. And I was friends with Tracy, you know what I mean? And, and, and some of the other guys in <coughs> GNR. And he was like, come down, I'm going to play with Guns. He was playing in Black Sheep at the time and and what, like like i said i was still new in la so i didn't know all the history of flash and tracy and all these other all the people that all that intermingle of all these different bands and uh but we went down and saw him and and mick's like ah, i look stupid <laughs> it's just like how what it was slash was awesome but it was like we went we went and checked out a bunch of different people and then then tracy got into the mix of doing different stuff and he wanted to do la guns i got i was just dead set on i love the name faster pussycat and i just 
and that came through Chris Chris Amaro and Mick, and I was they turned me on to Russ Meyer. Yeah, and, like that's just the coolest fucking name. So I just I kept on that path, and I was just meeting people, and I had met Greg, and then I had met Mark, and then I met Brent through Mark, and then just slowly started piecing people together. We went through a couple different bass players at the very beginning. Well, Walter was the first bass player, right? No, there was this other kid. I can't I can't remember his name for a, like two rehearsals. Right. And then we met Walter through Robert, Mick's brother, and they were really good friends. And and he was just looking to do something. He was in his own world, but he was he was unique. And I like Walter, but it's just like he wanted to do his own thing. He wanted to do his demolition gorgalore and stuff. But uh, Kelly then, Nichols comes in. Kelly, yeah, Kelly was my buddy. I met Kelly through, I think it was fucking Westy, Steve West. I'm not sure when, I can't remember, but we, because I was friends with this guy, Scarlett Rowe in New York. I was friends with a bunch of New York people and stuff too, even though I had never been there, but uh, just through the scene. And me and Kelly met and we just fucking, I think it was through Steve West and we just hit it off really good. He was like, turned into like my best friend and then i was like you're gonna be you know he wanted to be the bass player faster puts cat too so it was, so that worked out really cool and then he got hurt so and yeah he's been on the show a few times and he we detailed the accident you guys were uh, going to celebrate uh, on your way to the rehearsal place and he was on his motorcycle and he had a, a bad accident really uh, messed his yeah. leg up and yeah. There's a famous show, and I think it's on YouTube, but you did a benefit for uh, for Kelly. And Izzy Stradlin comes on stage and plays like he did with you guys quite often. I think he would jam yeah. Starfucker at that point. But uh, but Eric Stacy played bass for that show while Kelly was laid up in the hospital. And from what I've heard, that uh, you guys are trying to get signed, obviously. The band that Peter Philbin originally comes to sign is the band that has Eric Stacy in it. And while Kelly's laid up, you kind of just had to move forward, right? Yeah, I I held out. I was the last one holding out for Kelly. But Kelly wasn't really doing anything to make himself better. You know what I mean? It's not only so much you can do, but he wasn't. He was really bummed. He was like, I think that was a, one of the first times I had witnessed somebody being like really depressed and which that'll do it. You know what I mean? But at the time too, I was like, I just wanted to keep moving. I wanted to get shit going, but I was the last guy to hold on to keep. No, I don't want to get rid of Kelly. We, could, Eric, you know, Eric was a way better bass player in terms of technically, you know what I mean? <clears throat> I just was really close with Kelly. You know, we were really, good friends and I didn't want to just leave them fucking high and dry but it, it came to the point to where it was like we're either going to get a deal with Eric or we're not going to get a deal and I just kind of put everybody else's you know we kind of made it a, a band decision so one of the things I've heard about you from everyone who's worked with you especially the original lineup is how focused you were that drugs and drinking really weren't your priority uh, at all. I don't think you even were doing drugs. I didn't do any fucking drugs until later. <laughs> that was much later. But you had a focus and you had a vision what you wanted out of this band. You know, Jizzy Pearl was on my show talking about when you saw someone get signed, it was like golden tickets. And at some point you feel like you're gonna run out of these golden tickets. You know, you're watching your peers. You know, his band Love Hate would get signed later. But at that time, it's the famous show, Jet Boy, L.A. Guns, Faster Pussycat, Guns N' Roses on the same bill. Jet Boy was signed probably before everybody. Yeah, we had, had to re-record their record and got lost in that um, got lost in that shuffle. So your your focus and staying out there and continue to play and doing what you can to get signed, um, obviously it, it paid off. Yeah, I mean, it was we we were hustlers. That was what we did, and I learned a lot of that too from Poison, you know, because I got to be friends with Ricky, Rocket, and those guys were just promo hoes. You know what I mean? They just they 
they were ruthless when it came to all that stuff. But you learn, you pick up a lot. You go, okay, that's what we did. We promoted the shit out of our shows, and it was, you know. And then we had a lot. We weren't ever the fucking best band in town. That's by far. But we were fun. We had a good time, and and we weren't like the crazy poison fun where it was just like they were silly string and all the shit. We were we were fun, but a little, but a little darker. But uh, just that whole scene with. LA Guns and Guns N' Roses and and Jet Boy was, you know, it was it was a lot of, you know, pimping and promoting, you know, and that was and it happened fucking fast. You know what I mean? You think about the period of times, it was like months, not years of developing. This shit happened in months, you know. We were signed, we were signed with a record deal 10 months after we started playing. So it's like that's yeah, how it's, it's and, and had a following and we're packing all the clubs within 10 months you know what i mean even earlier than that but that was just by the time we actually got a deal we we would have got a deal even earlier but we, we weren't the best band and we played some shit shows and it kind of slowed down the process a little bit but eventually came peter came around and signed us we didn't have we never had a huge deal rick browdy came in and you know helped facilitate it and said i could do this i could do a record for this so we you know we weren't we didn't get a deal with some huge record budget which you don't really need you just need to get in the studio do some recording vicky hamilton also managing you guys for a while right oh yeah yeah she just called me this morning too i was left a voicemail i haven't heard it yet i just saw that she called just before we got on this so. i remember talking to brent uh about Vicki Hamilton, and he, he was stressing her importance, and that even though she had a Sue Guns N' Roses at some point, he would say if anyone who was there knew that Vicki busted her ass for Guns N' Roses, put up with a lot, uh, and same for a lot of other bands, and he said really a lot to do with Faster Pussycat as well, you know, her her influence and, and hustle, you know, like again, at this time, after you guys get signed, I think LA Guns get signed next, now, uh, now you're just starting to get to the third tier you know uh of of that hollywood scene and it's getting harder to get signed you guys come out at the perfect time the self tyler record comes out the same day as appetite for destruction right i know it's crazy that was kind of tough because they were our friends that, and that was that we we're we we're all been waiting for their record for a while you know their record was supposed to come out way before ours so i don't know but uh it was pretty cool. We we got to go to Europe with them on that first little start, so that was fun. Now I want to point out that you have you're working on a book right now, so yeah, which is great because I have so many stories. So I'm not going to get into everything. We'll we'll do some over uh, looks, but uh, in in that time you go over the UK with Guns and Roses, and there is a famous story about Guns and Roses tying up uh, Mark Michaels in. <laughs> <laughs> in an elevator it was yeah i've heard different things about it but it was like yeah mark ended up passed out in uh i don't know duff and slash's room and they just he mark would get drunk and just like stupid he's because he was so skinny and just fucking lightweight and he passed out and i don't i don't remember all of it just what i've been filled in by but by some of duff and and izzy and shit but uh yeah they duct taped him and and carried him into the uh because mark was like just bullet he threw like some chairs out his window like trying to be just retard but whatever so this is, uh, yeah that, but yeah he ended up they ended up pushing him down putting him in the elevator and sending him down to the we were in some in an old, old school hotel in germany in Hamburg. Brent told me that he came back and he said, we got to go fight uh, Guns N' Roses. And yeah, he said, Brent, Brent roomed with Mark. In fact, uh, I think I was room with Greg on that one or Eric. Yeah. It's, it, it, uh, and he described him sort of like a, like a Wiley Coyote or something, you know, he his hat was all messed up and he, he wanted to go uh, have this big fight. And of course this just brushes over and, and, and moves on. But, yeah, your records are out at the same time. 
you're both on the road and you know <laughs> eventually obviously the guns and roses hit it hits obviously but it didn't even guns and roses still didn't hit right away mm -hmm. no it was a while but I thought it would. I thought it would hit when when their record came out, and I heard it, and I listened. To it, I was like, "This is the fucking best record." I loved it because me and Izzy are really good friends and shit back then too. But that whole that when that record came out, I was just like, "This is the shit." It was just so good, and I was like, "What the fuck, people? Why?" I, I couldn't get why it wasn't taken off. Ours was to us when we heard our record and we got it. It was like to to us, it was our demo. You know what I mean? It was our live like a suicide. You know what I mean? But it was a full record. <clears throat> we just started playing. These are all these songs are new, and we're we are already into writing stuff for the new one. You know, with Slip and some other stuff. So, but yeah, was I was Avalon? I was surprised that the appetite took that long. But then when it did finally take out, it just reassured you. Yeah, yeah it was huge. Out of space. Yeah, it was huge. Was Babylon the first single from this record? It was supposed to be? No, Don't Change was the first. That's what I thought. There's a 45 of Babylon. and Babylon came out second, but it wasn't, yeah, it was like just, I don't know if it was, it was more put out just for the vinyl. You know what I mean? Just for, just a product. product I, they, didn't, they didn't really push it because it was kind of a, just a goofy song. And, but I don't know. They didn't really push it as a radio single. You know what I mean? So. Don't change that song is the first video. Russ Meyer, who directed the movie Faster Pussycat Kill Kill, directs the video, and uh, which has got to be a, a, a great honor to have him there doing that. That was cool. Just have a three-minute movie made by Russ Meyer for us. That was fucking killer. Yeah. And he had, you know, uh, some of the uh, big busted women, which was his trademark, definitely the Russ Meyer trademark. And... Can you tell me a little bit about his directions towards towards you when you were making the video? Oh, he was just just he was animated, and we we just did what we did. But he was just like, you gotta go. I'm just remembering, go, don't change that song, Tammy. I just remember him saying that. Don't just gotta do. Don't change that song, Tammy, to the girl. So it's like, and I was like. Rusk, you can call me Tammy if you want. Uh, you let him get away with it. Yeah, I heard he he would tell you to get emphatic with him. He wanted you to get emphatic with. The, I know, uh, and I'm just like, okay, well. So, but then we had, if you look at the video too, you got Heidi Richman, which is the girl I was dating at the time, and Ricky Rackman. They're right up front doing their things. It was pretty funny, but we had all all of our friends there at the video shoot stuff too. So. Uh, that around this time also uh, the metal years, which put was really helped with faster pussy. <laughs> you were such a part of the cat house. You and Ricky, uh, you know, co-own the cat house. People think the cat house is an actual club, and you can go visit the club, and it was every night. But no, it was a once a week thing, right? Yeah, yeah. Tuesday once was it week. Tuesdays? Yeah, it was Tuesday. I'm trying to remember because Pretty Ugly was Wednesdays, so mm. I just I forget. I'm old and I'm sixty. I'm like, I, I can't remember. My clubs blur. But yeah, it was just once a night, you know, once a week. So. Penelope yeah. Spiris, is, uh, Spiris comes to make this movie. They're going to film at the Cat Club, uh, Cat House, excuse me. Cat mm -hmm. Club is many years later at the Cat House. And uh, it document the band. And it's, it, was, it was fun. And I think a lot of people, Fast Pussycat kind of got to uh, pick up. I, and what's this? Uh, Steven Tyler has issues with your scarves. Um, it was more that was more that was joe perry oh he, joe said it okay uh -huh. yeah. but we had met too and we had met uh we had met tyler and stuff at the cat house earlier because that, that was done at the probe when we moved over to the probe when we started the cat house it was at osco's so but at that very beginning the first few months we're at osco's and then but uh, we had Matt Tyler there too. That and Penelope was awesome. That doing that, we had just got signed to Electra, and they're like, "Yeah, they want you to be in this movie, The Decline." I never even heard of The Decline because I was still fucking just naive and just un whatever you wanted, <laughs> unknowledgeable or whatever. Yeah, Brent's brother Todd was a production assistant on it. I think he was dating Penelope's daughter or something yeah Anna. yeah 
Yeah, and, no, he uh, was. And so, but yeah, I, you know, good friends with both of them too. So, and of course, the, you know, the cool muscat. <laughs> we always call him. <laughs> yes. So, yeah. Even though I love, Brent, I love Brent, but that was just a fucking, that's what we always called Todd the cool muscat. Yeah, no, I, I, I get it. it Tammy, this record should be gold by now, right? I have, maybe I don't. They don't make those anymore unless you request them and pay for them. I guess so. And plus, Electra is not even Electra anymore. It just got absorbed into Wea, so Warner. Wait, well, a lot of right, a lot of bands that ended up happening. But at some point, this record's 375,000 uh, copies for a debut band. And like you said, you were young guys. This was almost like your demo. There was momentum um, to go into that next record. And like you said. You had some of the songs already. You had already worked on some of the songs. For we Wake already Me. had all the songs. The next record, Wake Me, we were looking for a producer for a little bit. Lecter has wanted to find the right person. We went through a couple of people just doing a couple of demos, like little. We did Michael Beinhorn did did a couple of songs. We did like Little Dove and something else with him. And I really like Michael Beinhorn. He went on to do just huge shit too that was great stuff too but john was awesome and but when we went in to do wake me we we already had all the songs and they were already arranged we already had everything written exactly the way it was on the record you know what i mean john recorded it and had some ideas to help add to it but we didn't change change not one fucking thing on any of the songs unwake me going into pre-production of the studio so that was all done by us in terms which is of rare but you knew to save time and save some and money we, were kids. we weren't fucking we didn't we just knew what we liked in terms of our songs and we thought we knew everything because that's what you do when you're 23 you know what i mean or 24 years old i know i'm 20 fucking four i know everything now mm -hmm. you know, but, yeah um, i toured the i've toured the world already uh but we yeah. did, and then when we came down to doing whipped and stuff, there's some head button in that. I was, you know, that was where John came in a lot more trying to uh let's write 30 songs and then pick 10. I go, no, let's just write 10 good songs, you know what I mean, and not waste days on end. And that's where he butted heads on whipped. And well, Tammy, and one of the issues with whip that I heard you say, and we're jumping ahead, but is when you have a hit song, and on Wake Me When It's Over, uh, House of Pain is the hit song. That's the biggest single. <laughs> and uh, then what you said on Whipped is that everyone suddenly wants to write a song because they realize there's some more money in it. So now everyone's... Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. I was going to say, so now everyone's bringing in ideas that might not be the best ideas, but suddenly everybody's pushing theirs because they want to have a single on the record as well. I don't mind. That, that was never, ever an issue for me, is bring in... Bring in, bring in cool shit. Bring in, bring in good shit. Cause that's only going to help us. You know, I don't, you know, it's just a matter of certain players, you know, certain guys would bring in a riff and then not bring anything else with it. You know what I mean? You got to at least have two parts to it and then we could mold the third part or even if it needs it. So there was a lot of that. Not and if and if the groove or something like that didn't gel with me, because I had to sing the shit and write the melodies, because they weren't writing any melodies, you know. So it was for me to come up with any vocal melodies and and lyrics. So it's like <clears throat> for some of that stuff, I'm like, I don't, I'm not get, getting it. It's not coming, mm -hmm. you know, not coming for me. So let's move on. I don't want to sit. I, that's where it got to be just kind of stupid in rehearsals because we'd be in there at 10 and we get there at 10 and work until it got dark so it's like and i don't mind that's fun that's you know we're in there banging out rock songs and yeah that's well, fucking we'll get, we'll, but it's like draining when you're like beating a dead horse like this this riff doesn't work and it's oh we gotta make it work i know it's not gonna work i don't like it and it got to the point to where it was like now i hate it before i just didn't right. really like it now i hate it because it just doesn't work. Well, we'll get to whipped in a second. Wake me when it's over. This is the prime of Faster Pussycat. People are starting to turn on to the band. Poison Ivy, the first single, uh, and then House of Pain, obviously the big single. 
Now, in between those uh, those singles, though, Mark Michaels has the famous story where he uh, has heroin shipped in a teddy bear to himself, and he goes to the hotel. He goes ahead of the band, goes ahead of the bus to pick up this teddy bear. It was scanned at the you know, FedEx office or whatever. They knew it was in it, and he was arrested. Now, the story I always heard is that that heroin was just as much for Eric Stacy as it would have been for Mark Michaels. And you would have fired Eric Stacy if you didn't think it would have been too difficult to lose two guys at the same time. Is, is, that, is that true? That's close. It's close. We gave we gave Mark so many chances. See, the, the, the reason he didn't go ahead, we decided to stay in Kansas City. But our bus driver, we had two buses at the time, and our bus driver found syringes in the back lounge. It came to me. You know, I found, he was like, I found these in the back lounge. I figured I'll let you know. And, it, and we already had given Mark a million, you know, a bunch of chances about being fucked up and being fucked up on heroin just from his, his ex bunny. You know, and just him nodding off at rehearsal and just, I just couldn't deal with it. I was just like, like that point too. It's like, I didn't, I didn't drink. I didn't do any drug. I mean, I drank, I didn't do any drugs and I don't want anybody dying. We already had friends, you know, Wes Arkeen and a few other people fucking dying. I think, I don't know if Todd was dead yet. I think Todd, he might, I think he might've been just around that time. People, friends, girls and stuff that we knew. ODN and shit, and it's like last thing I wanted was Mark or us getting arrested. We got a record deal. We didn't want to be that band like the fucking Sea Hags, which I loved, but it was just just turmoil. You know what I mean? I didn't want to be lumped in to a heroin addict band. I wanted I wanted to try to get shit done. We were just starting starting off. You know what I mean? And trying to get a gold record and work on our second record and it's like last thing I wanted to do but Mark Mark I got in a fight with Mark on the bus you know what I mean not a fist fight but like a you fucking punk you know what I mean what the fuck is this you got fucking needles this is your shit you know what I mean but it could have easily been both that shit but we hadn't I hadn't dealt with Eric in terms of giving him any chances or nothing so that was his chance was, you know, that was, that was that. So it was like, Mark was in jail and fucking, he rode with the bus, rode with the crew bus. We stayed in KC. We decided to, cause we had some friends and chicks and whatever. Let's stay in KC. It was fun. So we stayed. Mark was all pissed off cause I just fucking ripped him a new asshole. And he rode with crew on their bus to KC or to Omaha. So, but it was more to get his drugs than it was to be pissy and fucking not ride on our bus. Everybody, it wasn't just me pissed at, everybody was. Oh, I mean, yeah. Except for Eric, of course. He was, you know, hiding. That wasn't you didn't me. miss any shows. Mark goes to jail. You guys play. Steve West from Danger Danger, who was on the road with you. He, he filled, filled in. in. He filled in terribly, but it was fun. So it was like, I mean, it wasn't fun, but it was fun because you made it through. Now I don't know if everyone knows who came in next and who was the drummer in the House of Pain video, but it's Frankie Benali from Quiet Riot. Oh, he came. We didn't miss a gig. We had the next gig was in after that was in, I think Minneapolis, and uh, he flew out and was learning shit, and we did a full set. You know, I mean, we we didn't have you know we didn't have we didn't have any time to, but we, you know, we pulled it off. I don't know how great it was, but I'm sure it was solid with Frankie. Frankie and Eric, because, you know, Eric's a great bass player. That, you know, and I'm sure he was on good behavior because I hadn't known about his. See, I was unaware of Eric's input in that shit until just after. I heard Greg, a story. Greg, I think Grant was filling me in on it, and I'm like, really? So well, I, I think kinda... Frankie hit Eric at some point. <laughs> I think Brent told me that. Yeah, there was uh, there was something like that, and I and I had Eric's back, and I fucking you know what I mean because he's a band member, and that was and that was one of the main reasons why Frankie didn't become a member. He wanted mm -hmm. to, and, and he was 
qualified. You know, he was fucking a beast. But it was like, you don't fucking, you know, I, I'm not going to be hitting, you know. If I don't get a hit him, you don't get a hit him. You know what I mean? Right. It's kind of like our our rule of thumb is we don't fucking hit each other. You know what I mean? He was a little bit older as well and, you know, and probably saw things different. It was probably bummed that he was trying to start. I, I know, I think his mother was sick and he was trying to raise, make some money. Uh, who directed the House of Pain video? If that was fucking, oh my God, I'm brain farting. That Michael was, Bay. Uh, Michael Bay. I'm like, I was just talking about this like a few days ago to a friend of mine. Yeah, Mr. Mr. Action Feature. It's insane, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's killer. And, and he was such a cool guy. The well, only reason we got him, we, he was, uh, we went into Electra and we were looking at some reels in terms of just how shit looked. And there was like, Electra was like, we think this would work really good with, with House of Pain. And it was like some video he did, he did for Donny Osmond. Or something. Amazing. Like, what? Donny Osmond did? And I was like, I met him and he was fucking super cool. We got along really good. And then after we shot the video, I saw a rough edit and it was like, it brought me almost to tears. It kind of did tear me out because it was, he did it so well. And it was like, you know, it's my fucking story. So well, this is something that's uh, close to your heart, obviously. Now, uh, Frankie Benali's arm is in the video. The decision yeah. was, I, I think that he just didn't look right. Or you knew at that time you weren't going to make him a band member. Yeah, we knew at that point. That was later. And it was like Frankie was our friend. And and <clears throat> that was it. We were going to look for somebody. I I had a guy in mind, that I, but I couldn't find him all of a sudden. And that was Slam from Zodiac. Mm -hmm. And... Um, when we got back and we're looking, I'm like looking all over for him. And he, he moved back up to Vancouver. So I don't know exactly what happened, but that's who I was looking for. And then I couldn't get, I couldn't find him. And it wasn't the days of internet and yeah. cell phones and shit back then. It was like, where the fuck did he go? I had no idea. And we got along really good because he was living in LA. He was actually dating my ex too, but it was like, we were just all good, you know, good friends. And we, talked about doing something in the future and then that happened and I couldn't find it. And then we had to, we had another record and a tour and it was like, I, we have to find somebody. So Greg and Brent and, and Eric were at rehearsals going through all these different, you know, we were on Electra. So we had tons of people sending in their stuff. So they were going through it and picking out shit and rehearsing. And if someone was good, then they let me know and I'd come down and, well, you settled on Brett Bradshaw, who sadly passed away not too long ago. Um, yeah. it, it, Brett was troubled. I, I remember that he he ended up having a knocking up a chick on the first on his first tour, I believe, and he had kids young and and as he got older, he had some he had some health issues and unfortunately isn't here. Um, Faster Pussycat drummers in general, there seems to be some some issues. Do, I got to ask tap. you, Spinal Tap. Yeah. Do, yeah, yes. Do you think that Mark Michaels is alive? I honestly don't think so, but I don't know. People, I, I've, I've had people try to you know, ask me and hunt down, and I've tried to. Well, if you find out anything, let me know. We've looked because we we control our publishing and stuff too. So, so we've been we we've, we've had attorneys. We've had our attorney, Holly, which is Rick Browdy's wife. Is my attorney, so we've world. had we've had her and Electra's people trying. You know, there's just no. He's if he's alive, he's living in a jungle in Cambodia or something, or who knows? I don't know, Canada or something. I don't know. Are are the stories true that when you were maybe rehearsing at Mates, he was like hanging out in in the back, like by the the tracks, the train tracks? I have no fucking clue. That's a story know. from Brent. You got to talk to Brent, Brent about it before the book. Brent, they keep some of that shit for me because they know I'd fucking I would lose it. So supposedly he was hanging out behind mates, uh, like sort of listening while the band was rehearsing. I think this was around Whip, um, and it was, it's such a crazy story. And then I've heard all kinds of Mark Michaels rumors. You hear one that he was on Hollywood Boulevard asking where the scrap bar was. Obviously, scrap bar was in New York City. Yeah. And, uh, but yeah, um, 
tragedy uh, with with these guys. A and going into the third record, Eric Stacy will not last uh, to tour for that record. At least towards the end, you brought in another um, bass player. I feel Just like to fill in for the last one last little run that we did. That we I did. saw it at the Ritz in New York. Yeah, um, kid, this kid, a Hawaiian kid named Aaron. <laughs> but that and then that was it then that was that was the end of it that was just mark just mark did the same thing i mean eric did the same thing mark did but was that how was that in pittsburgh with his girlfriend for the holiday and got arrested and i was just like boy you gotta be fucking kidding me and i was just like that ah, done with this guy too so mm -hmm. at that point you just want to keep what's left of your sanity you see the industry is changing oh it just exactly it totally just the whole industry shifted so it was like that's all i need is a another heroin addict and and the labeled already don't want any more rock bands so we already lost our deal with electro so at that point it was like that time to either change up something or or just do something different did you get dropped when you were on tour with kiss no, I think it was right after we got back. It was after the tour. It was yeah. just kind of like, because, but when we were on tour, Electra had already fired like 50% of their staff at least. So there was no reps in most big cities like Chicago. And I think we ended in fucking Miami and stuff. There's no, there was, yeah, it was like really weird on that last kiss tour. There was hardly any reps because we'd be like, yo, where's so and so? And they're like, nah, they're gone. And I'm like, mm -hmm. really? We're in Texas. And they're like, yep, we're gone. All these people that we used to hang out with, you know, they'd come out. We'd, we'd get used to it because we toured a lot through that short period of time that we were signed and stuff. <clears throat> we fucking, you know, we were, that was one cool thing about Lecture. They always kept us on the road. They, you know, most of the year they keep us on the road. So, we bounce from tour to tour and we'd see all these reps in these cities every time we came through. We always be looking for, oh yeah, we're gonna see fucking Joe, Joe Pulos, Sylvia. You know what I mean? We still see, see these people and they're they were just not there anymore. It's, you know, they weren't at even some there. point at some point college kids or nobody, right? Uh, people who didn't quite know the business. That's what I heard was happening. Yeah, I don't know. I just know that people that we knew weren't there anymore. And then by the time we got all that, and then we got home and then we got dropped and it was like, Electra's not picking up anything. We're not my like, sounds about right. You know, it was, it was the you know, sign of the times for a lot of the shit. So what do you think of this record? What's your personal thoughts? I think there's some cool shit on it. There's it's really all over the place because it was all over the place doing it. So it's like, <clears throat> I'm on the fence with it. I think the production was pretty good and there was some cool stuff on it. Like there were some cool tracks on it. I'm just like, there was more shit that was never finished. I don't remember what it is because I don't have all the work tapes and demos, but there's some stuff that I have that were just not finished you know what i mean that were better tracks that were just i just kind of threw my hands up i'm like i'm just going to save this shit for later but there was some stuff that came out on the ep right uh belted buckled and booted if i'm saying it right there were some songs yeah. too tight and some of those songs that yeah. kind of had yeah. the, the vibe uh, like i agree with you i think that record's a little disjointed it shows where you were going to go though body thief and jack the bastard if ha marketed those properly we still play the, the Jack and Jack and Body and Friends were fucking, I think three really good songs on that record. So, and they and came together. They came together quick and good. Me and me and Eric wrote Jack together and fucking <coughs> Body Thief was me, me and Greg and Friends was I think me and Greg too. I can't remember. I have to look. But that was those those three songs all came together super quick. And it was like all the other ones were like just beat to into shape. You know what I mean? So there was like like I said, it was a headbutton just trying to get 
some of the shit together. So when uh, uh, there's a there's a story, I, I Brent told me a story. I believe he said they were listening to demos of some recordings that you were trying to do to maybe shop for a new label. And uh, Greg, while driving, threw the cassette out the window. He was so frustrated. Uh, I said somewhere this unreleased Faster Pussycat cassette. Um, Probably. But there was, that sounds like a Greg move. He, he could get angry sometimes. Oh, yeah. Uh, but it's, it's so there was a time when you were looking at it. And at one point, Madonna at Maverick was interested in Faster Pussycat, right? We met with a few people right after the fact. I'm like, okay, if you think we can do something more and set up some stuff and was like trying to s salvage it. You know, at that point, too, it was like I told you, Eric was like, I'm already dealing with basically it was me, Brent and Greg. You know what I mean? Because <clears throat> we didn't, we had Brett, but it was like still he was still fresh in the shit and fucking and and Eric was out. So it's like I'm like, OK, if you think we I didn't you know, I wasn't just totally down completely. If something good came about of it. Cool. But if not, time to try to do something different. You know, we're still young and other shit. So maybe take a break from that and do a, some side, some side projects and stuff like that. So that's now, were you scared? Were you scared, Tammy? Were you thinking, how am I going to pay the bills? What am I going to do? No, because I just figured I'm still a hustler. I still figured I'd figure out other shit to do. I did this so I could figure out something. I wasn't, you know, I wasn't distraught or nothing. I or scared. I I was puzzled, going fuck. Okay, whatever. And I learned you learn shit from it that that shit don't last. You know what I mean? So it's like you move on to the next thing. So it's like, but when you're starting off, you just think that's the shit. Once you get there, you're set. Mm -hmm. right? You don't realize that the other bands that only had how come they only had two records you know what i mean mm -hmm. like, because that's all they lasted for so right. i use a greg Steele quote on my show all the time greg Steele said paraphrasing that you get signed you go on tour and it's like you're in in a, a, a twister you're being taken around and like the Wizard of Oz, and then you just slam right back where you were and uh it's all over and it's a it's an interesting way to look at it you now have to adjust to um normal life and you did hustle and do different things and as i said some of those songs were a sign of the direction you were going to go into uh, with newly deads in 2001 so a lot of years go by the idea is you put out the remix record the 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 uh sort of industrial versions of some of the faster songs and brent and greg were interested and i guess maybe there was some money interest also to have some of the original guys and you knew I'm not going to get rid of my band. Maybe in case this doesn't work, I still have my band. And uh, and so Danny Nordahl and Chad Stewart, who are still in the band 25 years um, later, at that point, um, Christian. And then uh, Greg and Brent came out. Greg didn't last so long in the reunion. I think a lot of people weren't prepared for what life was going to be like touring um, in the 2000s as opposed to the way it was in the late 80s early 90s and so greg he uh bowed out uh on on yeah. the road yeah he was he greg went out pretty quick <laughs> in cape back in into kc kansas city again so yeah again but yeah and brent lasted for a little bit and then we ended up but i just kept kept chugging away Shit was different though, but we we didn't have electro pain for all of our our stuff like we had before. So we were like budgeting and take caring and stuff, and not having the best buses or whatnot. But we got around and we got shit done, and it was like, but it was a party. It was like that's where I that's where shit changed in terms of drugs and other stuff. But it was yeah, it's a kind of a blur now. But it was. But we busted our ass. We, we do. We did like. I want to. I can't even remember now. I, I have it written down. I, I'm sh pretty sure it was 38 shows in a row. Yeah. We did on, I think it was a metal sledge tour. I think that we did because we did our shit in between too. We, but yeah, it was. 
at that a point, you a lot of cocaine and booze for sure. Yeah, no, no, you, I, I believe me, I, I went out with you on a few of those shows. I saw yeah. it. Uh, you see me. At that point, you you have to pretty much manage your own business. You you're paying the guys and and settling and doing what, as much as it's your business and your vision. And uh, but at that point, now you got you got to balance your party life with the business life. And like you said, sometimes you're going to get a bus that doesn't have an air conditioner working or it's going to oh, break. Had, and we've had some drivers that were off the just fucking nuts. So it's like yeah. We've dealt with a lot of different shit over the years, touring wise. Yeah, when you take care, I take care of all the shit. I pay all the guys. I pay, pay the bus, pay the fuel, do all that stuff. So we got merchandising. Us. You know, you merch covers, your designs. You know, we own all our merch, and that's the main thing that helps cover shit. So, Faster Pussycat's on the road to this day, and um, I I think the band's sounding better than it sounded in a long time. I think that you're playing the set that fans want to hear. You're really giving everybody the hits they want and some of the cool stuff, as well as some of the fun new stuff that this band's vibe has. And you got some younger guys in the band um, too, but they fit. Yeah. I, feel, I feel like they they fit the the, the lineup. You know, I, I'm one of these guys who I'm always like, oh, the original guys are alive. How come you don't have the original guys? But sometimes it's not possible. Brent Muscat is working now and, and has a normal private life. I think the yeah. music is, he plays around Vegas sometimes, but I think for the most part, he's he got a wife and kids and he has a, a, a private yeah. life. Greg had a successful career. He's, as got, a, he's got a wife and kids as well. He's here locally and we we bring him up. At the, when we're at the Whiskey is up, we bring Greg up. So, Which and I call good. Brent when we're in Vegas, I call him, but he's always busy. So Yeah, I mean, uh, do, do you uh, think there's any chance you would play with the, the surviving three again? Oh, you never know. No, mm -hmm. I never say never to nothing. If I would but, have asked you that 10 years ago, you, <laughs> you might have said never. I would have said probably never just because I was just fuck this shit. But you get well, old, you know, I mean, we're still here. So it's like you never know. I mean, even whether it be, you know, I probably would never be in a band with them again because if we just grown different ways and different things. But like I, I deal with Greg all the time still. And he's, he's wonderful. He's fucking, <laughs> and he's still sarcastic in the same fucking way he's always been, which is good. He's had a successful career as a sound editor and uh, he does all kinds of stuff. He does right? a bunch of home, home remodels and stuff like that with his wife and stuff. Okay. So that's new. Yeah. Okay. I'm yeah. Yeah, and he's oh, he's always busy with that stuff too. He's got different properties and stuff now. He's a smart man, so not like me. I'm just a fucking idiot. Well, I don't want to keep you all day, Timmy, but I do want to talk about your your health because uh, we talked about some of those later years where the partying um, took off. I believe it was right before the M3 festival that uh, your your health really took a turn, right, Timmy? That tell me what happened. 2017. Yeah, I had congestive heart failure. So, but yeah, it was just weird. We flew out to do like five shows on the East Coast. We played the whiskey, left that night, flew on a red eye to Long Island, to New York, played a show with guns that night. And then just, we had a show in the city at Bowery Electric. And then, then we had a show in uh, Delaware and then after that, we were <clears throat> in Delaware. We got to the hotel and I just got winded. And I'm just like, what the fuck? I just thought I was just getting like walking pneumonia or something. I don't know. I'm not a doctor. And and of course, I'm doing cocaine and chain smoking for since I was, well, not cocaine, but been smoking since I was 15. So, but yeah, I just got sick and ended up in the hospital in Maryland and they're like, you, are you diabetic? I'm like, no. And they're like, you are now. And then they were running different tests and they said I had congestive heart failure. So it's like, where it's your heart's not working. And I got, and then it was put, put in fluid in my lungs because it was working weird. So I ended up at the hospital at M3 for two nights while they were running all these different tests. And they said I had, you know, heart failure, diabetic. And I probably have lung cancer and I probably have kidney cancer. 
So I was like, great. This is fucking awesome. But when they said kidney cancer, I'm like, ah, whatever. But lung cancer, I go, probably. I go, would not surprise me. So, but I got back to LA and I found out I got doctors, got my heart shit sorted. They put a stent in my heart. In the same time, we're setting appointments for a part of uh, uh, oncologist because if I got cancer, so, and I end up getting a, a, a oncologist that once I had another scan done, they're like, you don't, don't have lung cancer. So I'm like, kill it. So that's like, the coolest shit right there. I don't, I'm like, really? So yeah, your lungs are falling. I'm like, okay, great. It was just a fluid that the other doctor saw from when my heart was working weird because your heart sits basically right between your lungs. So it was putting fluid. And that was why I got sick when I ended up in the hospital. I'd lay down and it felt like I was drowning. So I had to, when we were in Delaware after the gig, I, I had to sleep sitting up against the headboard. So if I laid down, it felt it was like that. It was fucking fucking weird. So that's why I went to the hospital the next day. On the we were going to Maryland. We were supposed to go to Pennsylvania to do a gig, and instead we went to uh, said fuck the gig because it was way out of the way anyway. We were going to cancel it, whether we did that or not. Just to go to Maryland, get there early for the M three. But we have friends in Maryland too, so we're like, let's go there. Let's, we got on the horn with our buddy. It's a, FBI agent Joe and found, just find an urgent care. I thought I had like just walking pneumonia or something like that. Went there and then they were like, "We can't do anything for you here. Just go to the ER and we're gonna just gonna charge you. Go there and they, they can if something's up, they can help you." So we went to the hospital by my friend's house and then that's what she wrote. So I ended up being in there. So that's how that. So came. This is 2017. You've made a massive turnaround in your health. Um, I've, I've had you on my show in my tour diaries. I showed you and Stephen Piercy. I said, who would think that you guys are, are the ones who are not drinking? Uh, uh, but it's not only- Stay alive, you know what I mean? So, But not only did you stop drinking, you stopped smoking cigarettes. Obviously you stopped uh, cocaine, you know, and- here that was are. a big thing too, is my smoking. I mean, I did coke, but I wasn't like a, you know, when we were touring, we were partying. That's when we were doing. When I got home, I'd be like, you know, socially or whatever, and and drinking. I'd be get home from tour, and I'd be like, I don't even want to see booze. Right. But but I smoked that coffee and then cigarettes, and I was disgusting smoking so much. But yeah, so I turned shit around quitting smoking was the toughest part but it had to all the other shit had to go too because it all makes you want to smoke <laughs> yeah well and you you've said you stay on the bus because you really don't want it because you're not drinking or smoking in part the last thing you want to do is be in a smoke-filled club the whole time so the bus acts as your home but also your dressing room so you don't have to be in a venue any longer than you, than you need to exactly it's like my buffer zone especially when i first stuck when i first got sober it was like my complete buffer zone because I just didn't want to be around it. Cause I didn't know if I'd slip, you know what I mean? I'm, you know, I ah, just want to smoke or just add ah, one shot. You know, there's, there's times you miss the fun of it, but just like, yeah, the repercussions and shit. I don't, you know, miss, I don't miss a hangover yeah. and I'm 60 now. So it's your body's different. Yeah. yeah. Your recovery is not going to be the same as it once was. Your performance on stage is better than it's been in ages. I think you have more wind to sing and to be on that stage. And I think that just talking to you in general, your mind is clear. That's why I'm looking so forward to a book by you, because you do remember a lot and you've been compiling and what you might have missed your, your going over. You're married now, right? No, but I got a fiance. We've been together for fucking we're basically common law married right We're to forever we'll we'll tie it somewhere where it's out of you know unexpected and out of the blue some are cool but but you seem you seem happy you know and and what a thing to we'll go through all the ups and downs of this life and this business 60 years old to find yourself happy to find yourself sober and still doing what you love because faster pussycat isn't uh, taking a break next year I'll be on the 80s cruise as well as Faster Pussycat. So I'll see you at sea for eight days. And then 
why not? Let's get on another cruise right after that. The next Come day. On. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Two cruises back to back. So that's going to be interesting. One day to do laundry and then get on the next one. Yeah. That's it. Exactly it. You, you went from touring the road uh, to touring the seas. Uh, uh, and now if I can just string cruises all year round, there we go. I don't need to get on a tour bus again. I can just bounce from boat to boat. Better better weather. Yeah, nice places to see. What's what's next for Faster Pussycat? Uh, any new music again? I know you just put some stuff out. We got motorbike coming out. We just don't know yet. I got a point that I got a Zoomy with Golden Robot on Monday. It's done. It's already been turned in. It's a song called Motorbike. And the B-Sides uh, cover we did of Don't Change by NXS. And we're doing vinyl for it like the other, like Nola and Ghost. <clears throat> so eventually, and then getting the next song ready to go after that. We just had the boys in doing backgrounds last week. And that song called Pretty Ugly. It's about the club. So. Yeah. And that's coming up after that. So then what we'll probably do is put all these tracks together. We got a few other ones that are in the works that I'm getting together. Fin fin a lot of a lot of his most of it's recorded. It's just not all done. They're having Sam Bam redo a bunch of the guitars. And so there's like three more other ones. And we'll probably then put all of them together to do a record. But we'll probably put out a boxy thing first of all, the vinyls. And so I just take it one thing at a time. So motorbikes next, and that when we release it, it's probably going to be. I'm guessing more February, probably February or March, or maybe right before the boat. So I don't know. Yeah, well, you're always ha you always have kind of cool ideas and marketing. Um, it's just to sell things. Always put out kind of cool packages and things, and try to be a little a little different and be true to yourself because you have that eye. And, you know, you do it because uh, it's for you just as much. I should also point out that uh, I just did a video in the studio with Wednesday 13. and uh, Awesome. And a, a great guy. He's on my show once a week, usually every Wednesday, but he's on the road right now. But he asked me to sing some gang vocals on a song. And I got to tell you, not only was it an honor to be on a song with Wednesday 13, but it's a Tame Me Down is on the same song called No Apology. Oh, you're on that one too? Oh, killer. I can't. The song's, the track's killer. Alex just messaged me like uh, last week from Italy, just going over. He had somebody else's mixing it. He said, it's just turning out really fucking killer. And thanks for doing it. Alex was in Italy looking for, looking for a home. He's thinking about moving out to, out to Italy, so yeah, Alex Kane of Life, Sex, and Death. He produced, yeah. co-produced, and engineered. And uh, but it is a great track. I'm fortunate to have heard it, and I'm fortunate to share uh, a second uh, in time. That's uh, fucking with you. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, it comes out. Yeah. That record comes out in February. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm gonna try to get when Wednesday get when they get back. Too, I have him. I'm pretty ugly. I'm thinking of having him. Uh, do a line on that if he wants to. I'm sure he might set up the track and let me let me know what he thinks. If had a little section where I thought it'd be cool for him to do a line, so just to be part of it. Yeah, I think it'd be great. I know he would be honored. He he's a he grew up on all that music just like I did, and uh, uh, fans fast music. And we'll see you at the Rainbow Bash. I gotta I can't forget that. This has got to yeah, be the best Michael Rainbow. Monroe, yeah, that'd be killer. This has got to be the best <laughs> one. Yeah, yeah. Michael Monroe and. <laughs> And then if you're really a Sunset Strip purist, you got Odin. You Odin, know. I know. And I, I asked Jake, I go, fucking, I had no idea they were even still together. I don't think they played a show in at least a decade, so I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I thought they were right. going to kill themselves if they didn't make it big. So. I know, he didn't keep it. Well, listen, it's never too late. Maybe no, I'm glad didn't. he didn't. I'm glad he didn't. But. <laughs> if he doesn't get signed after this show, uh, yeah. you know, who knows? And then Jim Dandy is going to be there. I know. Arkansas. Mm -hmm. I know so, that's, it'll be fun, but be me, nor me, I'll hang out for Mike. But you see, on those things, I just take the motor, I get on the motorcycle with the woman, ride up, get on stage, come off stage, get back on the motorcycle, and ride off. So it's, mm -hmm. a, it's a clusterfuck up there. So there's no real, yeah. it's there's it no real crazy. hangout. Yeah, there's no real hangout otherwise, especially because I'm sober. So I'm not everybody's drinking and I don't want to be 
but I've gotten used to it a lot more, like I said. So, mm -hmm. but it'll it'll be fine. I want to see Mike Monroe. So, yeah, no, that and and he's on the cruise as well, so we'll see a bit of him. Yeah, and uh, Sammy. Go, yeah, yeah, and Sammy Alpha. Everyone can go to FasterPussyCat.com. That's where you find out more. Tammy Down is on all your social medias as well, and uh, look forward to more. And Tammy, I'm so glad that we were able to sit down and talk about such finally. A, finally. Yes. We see each other enough, but it was. I'm glad that we got to uh, talk about this, and I'm glad to see you doing uh, well. That's the most important thing to see that you're healthy and uh, still doing what you love. You too, Bubba. Thank you, everyone, for watching, and uh, make sure you subscribe, check everything out, and we'll see you again soon. All right, thank you, Tammy. No problem.